Well, last week on It's Time to Talk, a very spirited discussion about the Victorian bushfires took place. But one of the aspects of the discussion that we thought would be very important to follow up on was brought to our attention by a caller from Lake Katai. Now, this caller suggested that Lake Lake Katai would virtually become a death trap if a major bushfire ever took hold. He claimed the three exits out of the town could quite easily become cut off, leaving the community stranded and at the mercy of any fire. Throughout the night, other callers rang in to agree with that um, that claim, and they said that traffic congestion during such an event would also be impossible to negotiate. They all had one simple message. Hazard reduction burns are needed along all the Lake Cadi exits, especially along the Ghost Road, to ensure the community could easily flee the area in the event of a fire. Uh, Inspector Schmitzer, welcome to the It's Time to Talk program. How are you going? Um, well, thank you. Uh, besides the few little technical hiccups we've had at the beginning of the show, but thank you. Lake Cadi is no stranger to bushfires. Do you think that the callers last week, do you think that they had a point? I mean, would it be a difficult area to evacuate if there was a, a major fire? Uh, I don't believe that it would be difficult to uh, organise an evacuation as such. Uh, um, obviously, there's some um, concerns with the residents uh, in Lake Hadai. Um, in regards to evacuation, most of um, most of that would be uh, organised through the police and um, roads would be closed off and... Um, in and, and, an orderly fashion, um, one would hope that people would be uh, directed to a certain um, uh, location. I'll apologise for that, and I think that somebody's um, number 52 Chinese meal is ready. You mentioned that um, people in Lake Cadai bring concerns to you. Uh, what, what sort of concerns? Are they similar to the calls we had last week? Uh, I would imagine so. A lot of people uh, have uh, individual concerns with um, areas surrounding their property. Let me put some of the questions to you that were being asked of me last week, and I was very much on the spot last week because I'm not from Lake Cadai. I don't have that sort of information. One of the questions was... Is there an evacuation plan in Lake Cadai? Uh, I don't believe there is a, an evacuation plan as such for Lake Cadai. Uh, however, um, in the event of a, uh, a major fire impacting on, on that area, uh, a, a location would be identified, uh, whether that be from the RFS themselves or the uh, police would identify an area for people to go to and congregate at, uh, which would be identified as a safe refuge area if, if required. Would it be sensible to have that area that you're talking about well known amongst the community now before a fire strikes? Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's probably sensible. Um, I'm, like I said, I'm unaware of any evacuation plan for Lake Cadai as such. OK, now I understand that a lot of the land uh, along those roads exiting Lake Cadai are controlled by the National Parks and Wildlife Service. Uh, what precautions are taken throughout the year to ensure that um, if a bushfire happens, it, the impact is lessened? Uh, National Parks and Wildlife uh, have uh, management plans for all their parks, and uh, in those management plans uh, it's identified um, areas that require hazard reduction, so re- the reducing of uh, fuel loads in, in certain areas. Mm-hmm that would um, lessen the impact on the likes of Lake Cadai itself. So there is hazard reduction burns going on all, all year, is it? Or? Uh, well, weather permitting, obviously, uh, yeah. but and, and um, there's certain time frames that those hazard reductions can uh, be taken taken place. So it's not every year in one spot that gets burnt. Yeah. Uh, there's uh, environmental issues that need to be considered and um, the fire thresholds that identify time spans between burns so they could they could range from uh, seven years through to um, 10 or 15 years in some some areas depending on the type of vegetation. Okay some of the callers that we got uh, last week suggested that there isn't enough hazard reduction burning going on along the roads that's what they were saying that the roads could be blocked off would you agree with that? there are some people may think that um, the the likes of uh, the ghost road you spoke of earlier um, it was only just uh, early or well, six or eight months ago where the national parks did a considerable amount of roadside burning along the ghost road. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some people may uh, consider that not adequate enough, but um, at the end of the day, uh, any any sort of activity to reduce the fuel loads in in those avenues, those those points of um, escape 
uh, are all worthwhile. If you're listening and you are from Lake Caddo and you have a question to ask or a comment to make, you can give us a call, 65852233, Now, also last week we were talking about the Victorian bushfires and, and down there the Country Fire Association well, they've come under a bit of fire for their stay-or-go policy, and I just want to explain that. I know that most people, after watching the news after all this time, understand fully what it is, but basically, if a bushfire is approaching, you, as a property owner, have to make that decision whether or not you're going to stay, bunker down, uh, do take precautions and um, fight the fire, or try, try to protect your property, or to go with plenty of time. That's basically essentially what stay or go is. Do, do we? I'm very curious to know if we here in New South Wales with the Rural Fire Service, do we have the same message to residents as they do in Victoria? Is it stay or go? Is that the policy? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, it's it's um, it's uh, put out there that uh, most people make a decision before this uh, before a fire impacts on their property. Mm-hmm. Um, they should have a fire plan. Uh, everybody in the household should be aware of that fire plan. Um, identifying, um, you know, if they plan on on going early, yep. uh, they need to leave before the fire gets there, not as the fire's uh, impacting on their property. Um, as the Victorian fires have shown, people that have left it to the last minute to evacuate and uh, jumped in their cars to drive off. Uh, all the all the television um, information that's been thrown out there, um, a lot of people have died in their cars. But, I mean, didn't they die in their cars because they've decided to take the advice of stay and defend property, but in fact it was completely futile and when they were left with no other option they've got in the car? No, that's quite possible. Mm-hmm. Um, the, uh, Victoria was a, a, a freak of nature. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, 100-odd plus uh, kilometre winds uh, fanning a large fire uh, is not... Not a normal uh, situation that you would come across every every year. Uh, so I mean, it's like uh, Canberra uh, a couple of years ago. You know, they're just uh, a freak of nature where uh, not nothing that you can do would um, would help you in any way. So I hate to put you on the spot here, Carl, but we are a country where freaks of nature, especially with fire, yeah. happen a lot. Can I just put this to you? If you lived in the city or even in a large residential area like Port Macquarie, uh, and if you're a homeowner, if you stayed in your home while your neighbour's house was burning to the ground, uh, if you chose not to evacuate because you believed you could somehow get in there and defend your property, the police would forcibly remove that person. And in fact, I think most people would agree that anybody who stayed to defend the property that was under the threat of fire is stupid. I mean, do you, do you think it's time to revise this uh, stay or go advice? No, no, I don't don't think so. It's still entirely up to the individual uh, household to whether they stay or whether they go. Um, however, if the, if the police uh, deemed it or if the authorities deemed it uh, serious enough that, I'm sorry, nobody can stay, uh, then the police have the ability to forcibly evacuate people. So, yeah. There, there are some people saying that the stay or go policy, I mean, people look up to authorities obviously for advice and and some people have taken that advice um, in good faith. Some people are suggesting the stay or go policy has cost lives in Victoria. Do you think there's any room for at least a a community discussion about this? Well uh, well, at the end of the day uh, uh, the resident's decision to either either stay or go is entirely their their, um, decision. Mm -hmm. Uh, The Rural Fire Service or any fire service wouldn't um, forcibly uh, advise any resident either way. It's it's entirely up to the re- the individual themselves. Mm-hmm. I, I've still am confused by that anomaly. That if you live in in a, a built up area, residential area, you're not allowed to stay and defend your house. You're not that you're not given that option. So I'm confused about why country residents are given that option. So, um, yeah, you know, and uh, I won't ask you to answer it. That's that's purely my opinion, and I understand that. Look, I also wanted to talk about the Victorian bushfires. Um, obviously, they had all hands on deck for it. Apparently, some firefighters from the Hastings went down there as well. Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, we we sent uh, eight firefighters down there um, uh, last Saturday. Uh, they returned uh, on Wednesday. Uh, which was yesterday, they flew back into Port Macquarie. What did they say? What was their experience like down there? 
Uh, their experience was um, uh, overwhelming um, devastation that, that's happened, especially through Marysville. Um, they were working in that vicinity. Um, so they were on the front line, were they, involved in this? Um, well, they were the aftermath of it. Right. Uh, there was a lot of um, uh, further backburning and, and mopping up, uh, blacking out the, the edge of the fire type uh, thing right. that the crews were all um, actively partaking in.